Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this, the Ted Maravillius America First Show. I'm your host, Ted Maravillius, and this is our third edition. Welcome. Tonight, our scheduled guest, Dr. Mildred Faye Jefferson, is not going to be with us tonight. What we're going to do is present to you an interview with her in an up-and-coming show, which will hopefully air in about a couple of weeks from now. So what we'll have for this shortened show will be a 20-minute monologue for myself covering the issues of United Nations control of American troops in Somalia, our local congressman's vote on domestic marriages or homosexual marriages in Washington, D.C., and a current update on outcome-based education here in Danvers. At the end of the segment, we'll have a five-minute talk by Jim Morose, and then we'll conclude with three minutes of my uh, concluding remarks. So sit back and maybe take out a notepad and, and jot down some information which you're not going to be reading about in the Danvers Herald, Salem Evening News, or even the Boston Globe, the epitome of non-biased news reporting. Okay, so let's get started. A couple of weeks ago, actually specifically May 4th, and I'm reading out of the New American Magazine, the Clinton administration took a major step on the way to delivering U.S. sovereignty or freedom to United Nations control. When U.S. Marine Corps Lieutenant General Robert Johnston relinquished command of the U.N. authorized operation in Somalia, this has taken place in Somalia, he left several thousand U.S. troops behind under the leadership of Turkish, not American, Turkish Army Lieutenant General Sevik Bir, B-I-R. The leader of United Nations Operation Somalia, otherwise known as UNISOM. Now get this next paragraph. Those American troops have now been officially converted into United Nations troops, complete with blue berets and patches. This marks the first time in our nation's history that our own troops, American troops, will be commanded by anyone but an American. If you remember back to 1952, which was primarily the first uh, major action that the United Nations took militarily, that great American, General Douglas MacArthur, was commander-in-chief of forces in Korea. And in fact, even though the United Nations was doing everything they could to hamstring us, Douglas MacArthur was saying, let's go all the way. Let's take on the Chinese because they're, they're killing us over the Yalu River. So we wanted to bomb the Yalu River Bridge. And what happened? When Douglas MacArthur tried to stick up for American troops and America first priorities, that is to say, to win, Douglas MacArthur got fired by the pro-communist president, President Truman, uh, which is no surprise because under President Truman's administration, uh, with the help of Dean Acheson, then Secretary of State, and General George Marshall, the United States government handed over China, headed by that great pro-Western Christian leader, Chiang Kai-shek, to the communist Mao Zedong, who incidentally killed more people than any other human being ever. So it's no surprise that that happened. And I give you all of this background just to let you know that even in Korea and even in Vietnam, we controlled our own troops. Even in Desert Storm, the Gulf conflict, uh, George Bush at least superficially came to the American Congress and asked for some type of permission, albeit he did not get a specific con um, congressional declaration of war, which is required of him. Nevertheless, he did go to Congress and the forces were ably commanded by General Norman Schwarzkopf. This, however, is not the case in Somalia. A Turkish general, a Turkish general is in control of American troops. This uh, fact was cited by not only the New American, but by the Howard Phillips newsletter. An excellent newsletter, incidentally, by the way, and uh, if you'd like to um, find out about it, please drop us a note and I'll be glad to tell you about it. Um, in the Howard Phillips newsletter, 
Howard Phillips states this about the United Nations control of American troops. The administration's plan also, the Clinton administration's plan, also calls for a substantial beefing up of peacekeeping staff at UN headquarters in New York. U.S. forces, in turn, would be more inclined to accept greater United Nations authority over the peacekeeping operations that involve them. And he goes on to say this. Recent models for the policy sh shift, the officials said, include the deployment of roughly 25,000 U.S. troops to Somalia and the planned deployment of 300 U.S. infantrymen to Macedonia, you know, Yugoslavia area, to prevent the Balkans conflict from spreading there. He continues, Parts of the proposed policy directive also stipula stipulates some of the conditions under which the United States would endorse, though not necessarily participate, in UN peacekeeping operations. These include threats to democratically elected governments, a high risk that local strife could expand into regional conflict, and threats to international security. If you take a look at all those three, three um, directives that would stipulate a condition in which American troops would be under the auspices of the UN, you will not find any of those conditions listed in the, in the United States Constitution. So, th indeed, President Clinton, not too surprisingly, is advocating something which is unconstitutional, big time. And uh, in another edition, the latest edition of the Howard Phillips newsletter, Howard Phillips states that the doctrine of the Clinton administration, like that of his predecessors, namely George Bush, I add, is to place American power, American resources, and American lives in the service of the objectives of international agencies rather than of our own national interests. In total disregard of the Constitution, the Macedonian incursion was initiated without a declaration of war or even a congressionally approved statement of purpose. At a time when the armed forces of the United States are being decimated, thanks to George Bush and Pre President Clinton, our residual strength is being dissipated in foreign adventures which require additional military expenditures utterly unrelated to the defense of our nation. Uh, we have a four trillion dollar debt, ladies and gentlemen, and we're sending troops to places that have nothing to do with American security, and even worse, we're placing them under foreign control. Howard Phillips continues, indeed, these expenditures place America in manifestly greater jeopardy than to which we would otherwise be exposed. In Macedonia, as in Somalia, our troops are serving under a United Nations command, thus further entrenching the dangerous precedent, and believe me, it's very dangerous, of making American service personnel mere mercenaries for the New World Order. And the reason why I concentrated on that, the reason why I specifically gave you these gentlemen's quotes is not to bore you, but just to let you know you're not going to be reading this elsewhere. Did you know, for instance, that American troops are under the control of a Turkish general? You ask your grandparents and your, your, your parents, uh, they would never have dreamed of such a situation. And this is not by accident. Way back in the 1960s, in a State Department document entitled Freedom from War, the U.S program for complete and total disarmament, it stated, and this is the policy of the federal government, incidentally this has not been overturned since it was written, that America's armed forces would be subverted or subdued into the control of the United Nations peacekeeping forces and after that happened there would be nothing to do, there, there would be no more power in the world, including America, that would be able to challenge a progressively, I call a progressively strengthened United Nations force. And so as a result, again, the freedom from war, the U.S. program for general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world uh, is, is, is now policy, and now, now it's being implemented. For 30 years, uh, conservative groups such as uh, Young Americans for Freedom, uh, the John Birch Society specifically have been warning about this, and now it's coming to reality. So you have to make up your minds are we going to pursue an America First foreign policy, which is what this show is named about, uh, America First, a U.S. constitutional foreign policy, or are we going to play the world's policemen at the detriment not only to our freedom, but to the world's freedom? Because once the United Nations establishes itself as an unchallengeable peacekeeping force, quote unquote, uh, there will be no one left to oppose it. Uh, just like you know, the Lord Acton said, Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. A one-world government, which is all this is, it's a synonym for the New World Order, will crush our country's independence and survival. And it seems to me, at the very least, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a patriotic thing to do, despite the constitutional arguments, despite the common sense arguments. 
And again, let me go back to Douglas MacArthur. Uh, I read an excellent quote the other day, and it seemed extremely applicable to this topic that we're now discussing. Bear with me. Douglas MacArthur, and incidentally, this was out of the Sword of the Lord magazine, a great fundamentalist uh, newspaper that's put out from, I think it's South Carolina, a great American state. Um, in this article, Douglas MacArthur says, and I quote, Seductive murmurs are arising that is now outmoded by some more comprehensive and all-embracing philosophy that we are provincial and immature or reactionary and stupid when we idolize our own country, that there is a higher destiny for us under a, another more general flag, i.e. the United Nations flag, that no longer when we send our sons and daughters to the battlefield must we see them through all the way to victory, that we can call upon them to fight and even die in some half-hearted and indecisive effort. And incidentally, Douglas MacArthur should know because, he, again, he got fired because he wanted to go all the way in Korea. I continue with the quote, that we can plunge them, being our soldiers, recklessly into war and then suddenly decide that it is a wrong war, like in what happened in Vietnam. The establishment was behind that. Or in a wrong place, Vietnam again. Or at a wrong time, Vietnam. Or even that we can call it not a war at all, which is a euphemism for a police action. Excuse my uh, continued uh, uh, interruptions here, but this is this is reads like a book, and it is such a prophetic statement from Douglas MacArthur. He continues, but by some more euphemistic and generic name that we can treat them as expendables, although they are our own flesh and blood. We can just throw them down the tube in a police war, a police action, and this is ridiculous. MacArthur continues. And even in times of peace, for some romantic reason, they must share, not as an act of generosity, but as a bounden duty, their national blessings and goods built from nothing to a height never before reached by man with others because, whether for neglect or not, they have not fared so well. That we, the strongest nation in the world, have suddenly become dependent upon others for our security and even our welfare, this doesn't, doesn't need to be. Listen not to these voices, MacArthur says, be them from one political party or from the other, the Democrats or the Republicans, there's internationalists and globalists in each one, be they from the high and mighty, like the Rockefellers, or the lowly and the forgotten, heed them not, visit upon them a righteous scorn born of the past sacrifices of your fighting sons and daughters. MacArthur continues, repudiate, um, repudiate them in the marketplace, on the platform, from the pulpit, that includes you liberal preachers. Those who are our friends will understand. Those who are not, we can pass by. Be proud to be called patriots or nationalists. And I'm sorry, it's a, a really bad word for those liberal media personalities, but nationalists. MacArthur says, or oh, what you will, if it means that you love your country above all else and will place your life, if need be, at the service of our flag. And that's the end of MacArthur's quote. And I'd like to say again, we should uh, put our sons and daughters in the service of our flag, not the United Nations flag, which was created by that communist traitor named Elger Hiss and 16 other members in the American delegation who were members of the Communist Party and 46 members who were members of the Marxist organization called the Council on Foreign Relations. I think I've covered that issue. I would like to now turn to the Peter Torkelson vote. I was a little bit surprised by this. Well, somewhat surprised. I was reading the other day in the congressional record, and incidentally, I have this ver independently verified from Senator Bob Smith's office, that a roll call came up in the House, and the vote was on this bill. It's an, actually an amendment, and I'll read it to you. No funds made available pursuant to any provision of this act shall be used to implement or enforce any system of registration of unmarried, cohabitating couples, whether they are homosexual, lesbian, or heterosexual, including but not limited to registration for the purpose of extending employment, health, or government benefits to such couples. Yeah, okay. Uh, Nor shall any funds made available pursuant to any provision of this act otherwise be used to implement or enforce this D.C. Act. The, this, um, what happened in the District of Communists, I'm sorry, the District of Columbia, uh, is that they happened to pass this ordinance which gave domestic partners benefits, that is to say, homosexuals who quote-unquote are married. 
Now, D.C. being actual, actually or a quasi part of the federal government gets its spending money from the federal government. And, of course, it's the taxpayers who fund the United States government. So your dollars are being used or they wanted your dollars to be used to find homosexual marriages in Washington, D.C., the District of Criminals. Now, the fact of the matter is that besides being violative of even D.C. statutes, uh, this is a gross uh, misuse of your taxpayers' money, and any quote-unquote fiscal conservative would not be used, excuse me, would not allow to be used taxpayers' money to propagate sodomites lifestyles in the District of Columbia. I think they can do very well by themselves and statistics show that homosexuals have higher per capita incomes and per family incomes than your average heterosexual. I mean, since when is the government of the United States in the business of propagating a lifestyle that kills people? I think it's very unfortunate. But let me get to the actual vote. The vote was um, 253 I, and that is they voted in favor of not letting D.C. do this. In other words, they voted against taxpayers' funding of gay marriages in Washington, D.C. And 167 voted to allow domestic partners, domestic partners, taxpayers' money uh, in Washington, D.C. In other words, if you voted I, you were against the use of taxpayers' money being, fund, uh, being used to fund homosexual marriages in D.C. And if you voted nay, you voted to allow taxpayers' money to be used for homosexual marriages in Washington, D.C. And we look down the list in the nay column. None other but our own fiscally conservative, Peter Torkelson. In other words, Peter Torkelson voted to use taxpayers' money to, or for the purpose of supporting homosexual marriages in the District of Columbia. And I thought you would like to know about that. Um, my third and final issue that I'd like to talk to you about tonight is just a current update of the outcome-based education situation here in Danvers. I came upon a few memos here, and, and I'll just read to you a few of these uh, memos that I received. This one is from the Riverside School. They're coming up with some multi-age classroom in Riverside where, you know, if you're a seven, I think you'd still be placed in the same grade if you're 10. I believe that that's how it, it works. It's, this memo is to Dr. Richard Santasano from Rosemarie de Resta, who apparently is the Riverside School principal, this is dated May 26, 1993. Take a look at some of this stuff in here. This is almost comical if it weren't happening in Danvers. This is something that I, you know, I would have expected in Amherst, Massachusetts, or Cambridge, not in Danvers. Uh, Multi-age, why? Well, they list a couple of reasons why. Number fourth reason, accepts diverse learning styles. Isn't that nice? Um, what they want to do is, if you are smart and you want to go ahead, sorry, you're going to have to wait for the kid who is not as gifted as you are. And so they're all going to come up at the same time, at the same level, at the same grade, and they're all going to be equally, equal, equally illiterate. And that's unfortunate. Um, let me get to some more other, more other uh, interesting items. Here are some of the courses, proposed courses, albeit. But proposed courses, they don't, or at least I can't find any specifics on these courses, but just take a look at some of these. In incidentally, this is an elementary school, and you know what the ages are for elementary. It's, you know, relatively young, right? Under 10? Black History Month. I don't see anything about white history or Indian history. I'm sure they have something about that. Or history of, of Greek people. And for, for that matter, I don't see any history of Nigerian people. Can't be exclusive between black people in Africa and black people in, on the continent of America. I don't see anything about Iceland history. Why don't we have Iceland history? Uh, this is a common argument against this multicultural stuff. And pursuant to that is another item on the list here called multicultural literature. Why not good literature? Why can't we have good literature? I don't care what color skin they are. It doesn't matter. But multicultural literature, look, 
this is just going to add bad curriculum to an already bad situation. Uh, Columbus, do you think they're going to get a good hearing on Columbus? No, of course, he exploited America, what have you. Anyways, you get the idea of some of the, some of the stuff. Human body, I wonder what they're going to talk about in that category. Uh, yeah. Let me just uh, say something else here about another. Uh, this is another, another memo, and i got to go pretty soon here. Oh, I hate this. This will be worth the wait, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes, goal four. Goal four of uh, the Danvers Public Schools evaluation of the superintendent by Cheryl Manley and Steve Williamson submitted June 1993. The fourth goal, and I will conclude my segment by saying this, to increase awareness of diversity in American society by emphasizing multicultural values, multicultural values as highlighted in our mission statement. What, what they're saying is the American Judeo-Christian ethic will be attacked whether by omission or commission and statements like this and I read we also recognize the difficulty of work in this area the school system is vulnerable in that its staffing does not reflect any racial diversity since when does staffing supposed to reflect America that looks like that's like Bill Clinton's well America's uh, my, my administration has to look like America that's pathetic if you're good, you're good. If you're qualified, you're qualified. And this multicultural values and all this garbage, man, you want to create illiterates, go, go right ahead. It's, ha it's been happening since 1962, ever since Engel versus Vitale and the kid got out of school. It's just happening at a local level now. And ladies and gentlemen, again, your tax money is at stake. So indirectly, you're supporting this. I am too. But let's do something about it. Let's be informed about how our congressman votes. Uh, let's take a look at why American troops are being uh, forced under the control, American Marines, under, uh, under the control of a Marxist organization called the United Nations. And other than that, let's have a nice day uh, tomorrow. Um, question everything you read in the newspapers, please, and don't believe everything you read on TV unless it comes from the Rush Limbaugh show. Thank you very much. And at this time, you can go and get an ice cream, and we'll be back after, the, after this. I'm Jim Morales with today's commentary. Today I'd like to talk about media bias. We've all heard the word thousands of times and at one time it meant something and we were concerned about it, but today it just seems to be just another word that we just kind of fly by and not pay too much attention to it. Today I'd like to try to define exactly what is media bias just so that we can re revisit this, uh, this term. I kind of scanned through the dictionary <coughs> and uh, media, it's a means, a channel of communication. Bias is to give a settled or often a prejudiced account on a subject. And I just did a little further digging and I uh, grabbed a thesaurus and uh, looked for a few similar words. Again, media, it's a mode, vehicle, channel, a form, a way. Bias, distorted, one-sided, partial, prejudiced, falsify, misrepresent, pervert. Planted. Literally, I guess we could put, put all this information together and say that media bias is a way to falsify. In a contextual way, we could take media bias and we could basically say that we are lied to in every form of communication available. We have the self-proclaimed mainstream media bombarding all the channels of communication with their interpretation of the news as opposed to objective journalism. There are still good publications and journalists out there. However, they are the minority. While the mainstream media distorts the issues it believes in, portraying them as progressive, constitutional, and morally right, they sugarcoat them. And any opposing view is labeled negatively, and they do it ever so convincingly. They pretty much mastered that art. 
The mainstream media will water down radical liberal social views in an attempt to sway the general public into being sympathetic to, to that particular issue at the time. All the honorable intentions of uh, the radical issue uh, sugar-coated just to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we like it. And they keep telling the same lie over and over again so that we begin to say, yeah, it sounds good. We buy it. Of course, any, oppo any opposition to that view is, is, is handled abruptly, and uh, they usually take the tact of personal attacks, calling any opposing view a, uh, someone would be a racist or a uh, fascist. Of course, they count on the fact that we have much too busy to uh, investigate. So if we did read or hear the same lie over and over and over again, it just eventually becomes the truth to us because we hear it so often. The truth, cannot, the truth can only be found after we search for it. After we'd search, just like we would search for lost treasure. And if we are confused after reading and being exposed to some of the media bias that's constantly bombarding us, let us consider this quote from Henry Ford I. The truth frequently seems unreasonable. The truth is frequently depressing. The truth sometimes seems to be evil. But it has the eternal advantage. It is the truth. And what is built hereon neither brings nor yields to confusion. I will give one example from the Salem News. It was the uh, publication date of Tuesday. Uh, April 27th, 1993. It was on page 16. An article entitled, Fails as Opposed to OBE. Uh, the author of that, uh, as noted in the paper, was a news staff report. Apparently, uh, they all got together and, and created this. I will just read one line. This one line was, in fact, a complete paragraph in this article. And the quote goes as this. And though a conservative fails said he is not a racist or a fascist. I can only assume that the author believes that all, all conservatives are racist and fascist. I, I can't look at it any other way. I, I, you heard the quote. You, you, tell me what you think. Uh, but furthermore, the author of this uh, is basically sending a message. Apparently, he's probably sent the message a thousand times before, and, and this one seems to be just a little bit more blatant, but he just wants to make sure that he conveys us a message that all conservatives are, in fact, racist. In conclusion, I would just like to stress the point that when you are confronted, or we are confronted with an issue, we become the jury, the judge, and the molder of America's future. Let us all search for the truth in these grave matters and issues. We must look beyond the mainstream media. We must look beyond the sugar-coated intentions. We must dig for the treasure and find the truth at the roots beneath the endless piles of rhetoric and bias and lies. God bless you. Good night. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this, the conclusion of the Ted Marvelous America First Show. This is a little bit different, of course, because we don't have our guests. Again, let me remind you that our guest will be Dr. Mildred Faye Jefferson, a candidate for the United States Senate here in Massachusetts. She will be joining us in a few weeks. Um, but for now, I'd just like to make a few comments. Jim Rose, who you saw in the last segment, was recently elected Republican Town Committee Chair. Congratulations. Um, oh, you might have noticed this on Jim Rose, and I just put it on myself. This is the famed Deficit Reduction Awareness Ribbon, first created by Rush H. Limbaugh III. This is to show that we care about the deficit, and actually, we actually care more about it if you don't have a ribbon. You see, this ribbon will help to solve the deficit problem. You know, just like you see those red ribbons, this will show that we care about the deficit. And uh, we think that you should have one on, too. It's a dollar bill, and if you fold it the right way, you'll have the words, in God we trust, on here. And it just, again, it's to show that we care about the deficit and that we're really trying to do something about it. Uh, incidentally, that article that Jim Morose alluded to as an example of media bias when Rick Fails, a school committee candidate, was asked whether or not he was a racist or skinhead or something like that, that article was written by Amy Seigenthaler. 
Amy Seigenthaler. And to my knowledge, it wasn't, it wasn't really retracted, or, or you know, there wasn't any correction. But just to let you know, that happens all the time. Uh, let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that our show is on Fridays, Channel 8 at 7 o'clock. So you know, before you go out at night, sit down, get your education in from 7 to 8, and then go out and tell others. They'll be glad, they, excuse me, they'll be glad that you did. Yes. Let me also remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that every Sunday is a new week, start of a new week, and let me encourage you to go to church this weekend. Uh, I go to the Peabody Tabernacle Baptist Church. Uh, that's located in downtown Peabody. That's an independent fundamentalist Baptist church, but go to church. Read the Bible. Uh, you know, there is a heaven and a hell, and we're going either, either up or down, even though the liberal media doesn't want you to know that. And I think that's about all I have to say. Um, I look forward to Dr. Jefferson, and so doesn't Rex, my, my special guest right here, see? Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, that will be all for tonight. And I thank you very much for tuning in. And next time, again, we'll have Dr. Mildred Faye Jefferson, and she'll be talking about a variety of issues. And we'll also talk about my monologue next time, the differences between communism, Nazism, democracy, a republic form of government, and anarchy, all the different political spectrums. And so I hope you'll tu tune in then. Until then, may God bless you. And in the words of Thomas Jefferson, ignorant and free can never be. Thank you. The preacher man says it's the end of time And the Mississippi River, she's a gold dry The interest is up and the stock market's down And you're only getting mugged if you go downtown